You're such an asshole. All right, let's get the show on the road. I got my coffee makes me poop mug. Took a shower. Today's my day off from the gym. I'm ready to get work. All right. Ah, now this is a different video, and let me introduce myself because we have a bunch of different listeners than the regulars. My name is Aaron Clary. I run a company called Asshole Consulting, and my specialty is basically being a uh, what? Not Ann Landers. Who was the other gal? Doesn't matter. One of those columnists. Except I'm mean. And I'm a jerk, and in being allowed to be an asshole, I can more directly, efficiently answer your questions, and I don't charge as much. I charge an arm and a leg, but if you cut the time down, it doesn't cost that much. Now, we have a very charitable individual who wanted to do kind of, quite literally, a public service announcement video, a video about the uh, uh, dangers and risks, particularly to women, but this really does apply to everybody, men and women, about the dangers and risks about going to law school. And a whole slew of questions, very thoroughly um, organized and put together. And I'll make some commentary in the end. Uh, but this gentleman, I think, never told me if it was a he or she. Uh, he's concerned about millions of young men and women going off to law school and the problems that they're going to face after if they make it through it. All right, so there is a big risk out there. A lot of you are being targeted and sized up as easy marks. And so this gentleman, I think, wants to uh, warn all of you and want me to put together a video and hopefully you will share with your friends and other people who are thinking about going to law school, you're currently in law school, certain types of law schools especially, and then you reevaluate whether you really want to go and become a lawyer. So. Hey, Clary, please keep this email anonymous as my intention is a video response aimed at hopefully spreading awareness and economic realities surrounding the current legal profession. The cycle in which I am noticing for young females in college seems to be attain a liberal arts degree and then use the legal field as a backup. And that applies, like I said, he wants this to be help out the ladies, but this applies to men too. Many unsuspecting hopefuls look at law school as the holy grail of six-figure salaries. My hopes are that your sniper-like critical assessment skills, coupled with my money, I always like the money, could be effectively utilized to truly educate future female generations. Women have officially outnumbered men in law school in the United States. One, in honor of this great achievement, I am looking to shell out dough on a video request outlining pros and cons of getting into the legal field in 2018. You are very good at cutting through the BS but I am looking for informed and detailed discussion regarding the seriousness of rushing into a legal field. And this is a great quote. I'm going to bring this up later. Based on laziness, laziness, truth by repetition, and 1960s economics. The structure of the video should be a pro and con discussion and just an overall critical thinking assessment of long-term ramifications. I have tried to break the questions up in a logical order, but feel free to deviate as long as you touch on all the questions with solid answers. I'm paying money for this. Yes, I've been reminded. Uh, please send rates and total cost for the video. All right. <clears throat> so the first group of categories of questions, and I'm, I'm going to apologize for answering them literally. I want to make sure I answer all the questions he put forth, and I'll go on and, and kind of draw my own conclusions and opine at the end. So we're going to talk about entry level uh, in terms of being a paralegal or legal assistant. One, pros and cons of getting a certificate. Yes, apparently it's a thing in paralegal slash legal studies in 2018 with respect to getting a job, does this give someone an advantage? Um, like any other field, yeah, if you have an associate's, that'll give you an advantage over someone who doesn't have that. Bachelor's over associate's, master's over that. And you can actually get a master's in some places of paralegal studies. Um, the, the problem, though, that this faces is uh, progressive credentialism, where well, that person's more employable than this one because they went to school for two years more, even though it's unnecessary and an associate's would do. And that seems to be the opinion based on my research of, of people in the legal profession, is that a, a, an associate's will do. You, some of them, you don't even need an associate's. You just work at the law firm as a secretary, maybe take some classes, and, uh, and then you're just promoted to a paralegal. Um, but now it's like, if you're starting to talk master's degrees, now you're going to school for six years, might as well become a lawyer or an engineer. Um, so th now it's, it's, a, it's an arms race of progressive credentialism. Um, so does it give someone an advantage? Yes, kind of like in the liberal arts degree world, it sort of does. A master's in English, terribly sorry, ladies and gentlemen, is pretty worthless 
if you're in an English-speaking country. Uh, does it give you some modicum of advantage over a bachelor's degree? Sure. An advantage, uh, an advantage over a GED? Oh, you know, yeah, because <laughs> you got a master's. But it's, it's, it's almost overkill. Is it worth going to school six years for that? Now, a little bit more specific, though, to the paralegal and legal assistant world. Uh, some states require some education, California being the most stringent of them. I think you, I think you need a bachelor's degree. Um, and then if not, then you certainly need a certificate. You need either an associate's or a bachelor's. Yeah, California certificate and 24 credit hours. There you go. Um, and if not, then you need a, a, a lawyer to sponsor you. And this ranges, there's 13 states based on the most recent research I did that have some kind of like, you just can't come out of high school and get trained. You need some additional education. There are certifications uh, put forth by a paralegal industry group uh, that you can get certified in paralegal studies to get your certificates, not a degree. And that helps, but it's not re often required. Um, so it's, you know, I, I kind of like doing a, a scaled educational approach to fields like you get your associates test the waters for a job market if you can't all right maybe get a bachelor's or then think of a different career because if it's going to be that hard for kind of something that would be you know it's, this is not nuclear engineering uh why why invest more time and effort getting an educate because if it, if an associate's in it do with a bachelor's no no a bachelor doesn't now i gotta get a master's well i wasn't i wasn't signing up for six years of school so what you'll definitely want to do is you want to research your state that's the key thing because the, the requirements are different. But before you even jump into it, you got to assess how much education you need. Do you want to spend all that time, effort, and money, and money, getting that certi uh, certification? Um, or is it like, no, you can walk in off the street, maybe take a class or two. I think it'd be worthwhile getting associates, but that seems to be the, the, um, the deal. The certificate, certainly, um, that's a 125-question test. I think you got two hours and change to finish it. Um, the, that certification wouldn't hurt either. Um, but yeah, if, if you're, if, if it almost seems like, you know, get in now before every state starts requiring, you know, like the CPA, you could test for the CPA out of high school if you want it. Now you have to have almost a master's degree in most states. And I'm, you know, 10, 15, 20 years down the road, that might be the same thing for a paralegal too. Pros and cons of getting a bachelor's in paralegal studies in 2018 with respect to getting a job. Does a bachelor's degree in paralegal so he's give you an advantage. Again, as previous to the, the first question, it, it, it does, but it really depends on the state and their requirements. And it's going to be a modicum of an advantage. Um, again, it's, it's not engineering. It's not accounting. It's not actuarial science. Uh, this is the paralegal studies is more akin to the liberal arts. Um, so I, I don't think, and here's the other thing that the median income, median, like mid career, this is not starting salary. This is what you could expect to make when you're mid stride, 10 years experience of, of a pair of legals, $50,000. You, you could, if, if you shake your booty enough, you can make more as a waitress or if, if you're a good looking dude, you can make more as a bartender. Um, so you're, you're going to be making less than that um, and my gosh shoot I know kids that get paid twenty dollars an hour to babysit because babysitters are hard, uh, hard to come by uh, so yeah you can get the bachelors but frankly I wouldn't not for fifty thousand dollars a year median income um, and you know think about this the states that are going to require like well you got to get a bachelor's you need a man you need this you need that those are typically large not to bring politics into it leftist states that have high regulation and high living costs you know uh, 50000 will get you a lot further in Arlington, Texas than it will San, uh, San Francisco, California. So I would, I would almost draw the line at a bachelor's degree. That's just me. Because, shoot, there's careers and professions. You can, you can make just that much money with a high school diploma. Where are they? Well, you got to work in the Bakken oil field and you have to you know, work night shifts and all that. But, <clears throat> but, yeah, I would not. It's not worth four years of your youth and your time and your money. Um to have something that maybe gets you 50000 a year. Is it better for college university students to get a bachelor's in paralegal studies or does it not make a difference when getting hired for any entry level paralegal uh, positions? Now, I've never ran a law firm. I don't know. But I did some research and we found uh, Gary Melhuish, 
Uh, he is the past president of the International Paralegal Management Association. And then there's another gentleman named Estrin. I forgot what his title was, but let me quote what they say because I'm not an expert in the field. But this is what people on the, on the front lines are saying. They're in the trenches. The level of education necessary to gain entry into paralegal field is greatly influenced by the geographic location, like I said, you know, California, New York, all that, of the firm and the person's individual goals. Educational institutions that offer paralegal programs are best able to respond to the specific requirements of the local legal community and any state regulations that have been put in place. Over the past five years, I've been serving as a member of the ABA Standing Committee on Paralegals Approval Commission. I've visited paralegal training programs in places as diverse as Los Angeles, uh, Big Rapids, Michigan? I think it means Grand Rapids, Michigan. Um, some schools offer AA degrees, other BA degrees, and some have post-baccalaureate uh, certificates, but the common denominator is that they have strong ties to the local legal community and understand the level of training which is desired by employers for their new paralegals. <clears throat> uh, then it goes on to say, I always encourage young paralegals who have not completed a BA to get one. So he's saying to get one, I'm saying the money ain't worth it. Choose, you know, choose your poison. It is certainly, it certainly is the standard in most large cities and firms and offers the greatest p options for mobility. But the BA does not necessarily need to be in paralegal studies. An AA in paralegal studies with a BA in almost any field of study is extremely marketable. Okay, so it's more the cachet of the fact you have like a four-year degree that carries it up. <clears throat> uh, Mr. Estring continues on to say, an AA used to be sufficient, however, most employers would rather see a BA degree. Like I said, progressive per credentialism, this is an arms race, plus a certificate from an ABA-approved school. There are about 1,000 paralegal schools in the United States and only are about 200 ABA-approved. Key thing. There are now 13 states with educational requirements for hiring, mandatory continuing legal education, and more. In some states, such as California, a paralegal without a BA degree must have an attorney who will, in effect, sponsor them. An AA degree is sufficient in certain parts of the country, third and fourth tier cities. An AA does not hold up very well in major metropolitan areas and definitely not in the major firms. No major firm that I'm aware of except paralegals without a BA, and many of them require a BA from a top school. Holy cow. All for 50 grand a year. I'm sure in these major cities they'll pay you more for inflation, but we get just for purchasing power. The AA degrees are phasing out around the country in lieu of the BA degree. One negative is the vocational schools that have sprung up. Some of these are misleading, charge a huge fee, and not getting paralegals jobs. They have no admission requirements other than a GED. It's a big black mark as far as I'm concerned. <clears throat> okay, so as I said before, this might take on your education. I would avoid progressive credentialism. You scale your education. Certificate, associates, test the waters. If not, up to you, dude. Do you want it? Do you want to spend another two years to get a bachelor's degree in paralegal studies, or you know, get a bachelor, or do you want to change your thing and go become a programmer or an accountant or something like that? Um, I know a lot of people who are interested in, in paralegal work are more maybe secretarial minded or clerical minded. They don't want to go and become an engineer or a mechanic necessarily. They maybe they just want to you know, have like a nice nine to five office job. Um, but you know, you could. You know, why not just go be a secretary? Why not? Why not? Uh, there's there's a lot of other stuff you can do. I I personally don't think it's worth getting a bachelor's degree just to eke out another ten grand a year. <clears throat> What's the employment outlook for paralegals? Okay, according to the BLS, they're expecting to add forty one thousand paralegals in the next ten years. And that but that's from twenty sixteen to twenty twenty six. All right, it's fifteen percent growth rate. That's higher than average. Uh, so the outlook looks good according to the BLS, but what you're going to find with the BLS is they're horrible at forecasting. There's no correlation, none. They, they have no ability to forecast. I even looked and did a study on this because I get a lot of other requests about, well, engineering, they, they say engineering growth is going to be slow. The BLS says the, the forecast of growth is going to be slow. And then you look at, they did studies tracking how good the BLS is at predicting um, <laughs> the... Uh, Future growth in different industries, and uh, and they're just horrible. They're just horrible. Hang on, I got to plug this in. This keeps phasing in and out. There we go. All right. Uh, so I would not. Fifteen percent is higher than average growth, but I would not base it on that. And you're not concerned about growth. You're concerned about wages. And if mean mid career is fifty grand, in a lot of cities that's a part time job. That's just you making grocery money and. And maybe maybe making a little bit of rent. 
Um, it, it just it just doesn't sound like a, a career unless you have no liabilities, you're single, or you have someone else at home working another job, and this kind of supplements the income. What can paralegals expect to make? Any additional comments or opinions related to earnings or quality of life? Median income, just under fifty thousand, forty nine five thousand. Like I said before, you can make more as a cute waitress or a good looking bartender. Uh, life of the paralegal, uh, I've never worked it, but what I've seen on discussion boards and when I did the research, it's tied to the lawyer. If you are in a downtown corporate office and you got one of these power attorneys, dude, you're busting your ass off with that attorney. You're working your 80 to 100 hours a week. You got no life. It, it sounds horrible. You got commutes. You got to park downtown. And, and he or she may compensate you greatly for it because para, a good paralegal is like a right, you know, they'll earn it. They'll, they'll earn it. But then you could be the, the local, you know, uh, bumpkin lawyer out in the country. You do your nine to five. Maybe you, you go home early on Fridays and take care of your kids or whatever. Um, and, and then you have a life outside of that. So it, it really does depend on where you are and what type of lawyer you're working for. All right, next battery of questions, lawyer candidacy. All right, one, is any law school not in tier one or tier two worth attending in 2018? Please explain. No. It's tier one, two, tier two, or go home. And, and let me explain the tiers for those of you who are unfamiliar with it. Basically, it's the top 50, the next 50, the next 50, the next 50. And there's a little bit of discussion as to what is what. But the tier one is the top 50 schools. Within the tier one, you have the tier 14, the top 14, where if you can get into those, that's okay, yeah, you go. You go, no matter what. Okay, you're, you're pretty, pretty much guaranteed to have a good life or at least a good career, which we'll talk about later. Uh, but then the remaining, what's the math? 34, those are still very reputable schools. You, you probably, pretty good sign if you get into those schools, you're going to do well. Uh, tier 2, not bad. Not bad. Really good chance you're going to get employed, but you may not be hired by what they call the white chew uh, law firms, which are the top law firms. Um, you know, So to liken it to banking, there's the bulge bracket Wall Street, and that would be the tier 1, You know, that's where you want to work. Tier two would be your Wells Fargo's, your Bank of America's. You can make a great career at those corrupt, horrendous financial institutions if you want, um, but you'll get employed. So there's nothing really wrong with, with tier two. Tier three, forget it. Forget it. We'll go on a little bit of this later on about the labor market and economics, but the, la the law market is flooded with legal gra law graduates. And once you get to tier three, it's over. Um, and, you know, you don't have to heed my advice, but I'm going to read this. This comes from outside the law school scam.blogspot.com. I don't have them in my notes, but also look up law school lemmings. Uh, please look that up, all right? If you just want to see some empirical frontline action going on, go through his, uh, his uh, scroll and feed. Tier 1. Uh, this is, quote, from outside the law school scam.blogspot.com. Tier 1. Excellent choices for trust fund babies. Others should seriously consider them while bearing in mind the very real risk of a bad outcome. You cannot, after all, eat prestige for breakfast. Harvard and Yale. Comments, no Stanford, your jive ass is not in the same league as Harvard and Yale. <laughs> Petulant California demands for representation in tier one. Don't sway me one bit. So you can kind of see why I like this guy. Probably would. Tier two, rich kids should feel free to attend these. Others should not enroll without a substantial discount and should weigh the risk of a bad outcome carefully. Columbia, Chicago, New York University, and Stanford Commons. Formerly, this category also included Michigan and Penn. Tier 3. Now, he's <clears throat> he has seven tiers, so not to confuse you. This is a different tier. Like I said, there's some room for interpretation. Uh, but do. do. Tier 3, rich kids are likely to consider these insufficiently prestigious. Others should not even apply without a free waiver, a fee waiver and should not enroll without a large discount, probably at least 50% off. Even then, the risk of a bad outcome would loom large. California, Berkeley, Cornell, Duke, Michigan, Northwestern, Penn, Virginia. Now, keep in mind, these are all, I think, still Tier 14. So this guy's very pessimistic about them. <clears throat> and uh, you're going to find this, his concern about rich kids and prestige plays a huge role plays a huge role. Comments. This category, which has shrunk considerably since 2010 or so, is the end of the group that, as of the last time I checked, 
uh, saw at least 50% of the graduating class get jobs in big law or federal clerkships, okay? So we are still in the tier 14. Uh, I advise against attending any law school below tier 3. Even tier 1 is questionable no nowadays. <clears throat> tier 4, expect a disastrous outcome at these unless you get tuition waived, have local connections, and intend to build your career in the vicinity of the school no farther away than, say, an adjacent state. As always, rich people can go here if they really want to. Now these, keep in mind, he's saying this is tier 4. These are tier 3 based on traditional measures, but I want to read through this list. Okay, because this is where it's dangerous. This is where it's accredited. The University of California, Davis, Boston College. Uh, what else we got? Arizona State, uh, uh, George Washington, George Mason. These sound all fine. These sound like, well, these are accredited. You know they're real colleges. Yeah, but they're not in the top, you know, 14. They're not that prestigious. So here they are. Alabama, Arizona, Arizona State, Baylor, Boston College, Boston University, Bingham Young. California Davis, California Irvine, California Los Angeles, California Hastings, Cardozo, Case Western Reserve, never heard of that one, Chicago Kent, Cincinnati, Colorado, Connecticut, Denver, Drake, Emory, Florida, Florida State, Fordham, George Mason, Georgetown, George Washington, Georgia, Georgia State, Houston, Illinois, Indiana, Bloomington, Iowa, Kansas, Kentucky, Louisiana State, Loyola, Marymount, Minnesota, that got a funny story about that. Nevada, New Mexico, North Carolina, Notre Dame, Ohio State, Oklahoma, Rutgers, St. John, Southern California, Southern Mesopotamia, Temple, Tennessee, Texas, Texas A&M, Texas, Tex, Tulane, Vanderbilt, Wake Forest, Washington, Washington and Lee, Washington University in St. Louis, West Virginia, William & Mary, and Wisconsin. Comments. Many of these are what Paul Campos has called trap schools. Others are toilets with employment figures that are better than those of typical toilets. All are best avoided from the full prestigious outskirts of tier 3 and the toiletry outskirts of tier 5. Alright, so there's no real reason to go any further and in depth uh, below this list. But basically, unless it's unless it's the uh, top notch, you know, the creme de la creme, your standard state schools are just not worth attending. They're just not worth attending. 50 years ago, it would have been different. Now, the market's flooded. Two, what LSAT should disqualify a student from considering law school and what IQ? All right, so I had to look up what the distribution of, of the, S, uh, the LSAT scores are. All right, we have your standard traditional bell distribution curve. Median, or mean, median, mean, sorry, mean score, mean average is 150. And uh, the low is 120, the high is 180. And uh, I, there's no, I, I don't know, you know, what is it? I would say if you want to go into law, you should at least be in the top half, one fi at minimum, preferably 155. And if you, if, if you really are good for law, I would say 160. Like if you could get a 160 on the LSAT or higher, all right, pretty good chance. Um, you know, it ultimately determines, you know, you want the highest score you can get so you can hopefully get into uh, the highest law schools. <clears throat> but if you're just curious, like, should I go be a lawyer, take the LSAT. And if, if, if you're below 150, hell no. I'd even say below 155. Um, but 155 and above, that's just me and my economic background, statistical background, ever so roughly uh, estimating it. Uh, the problem with IQ <laughs> And it's going to be the opposite. It's going to be contradictory to what I say. Is you think, well, and, and you're right, the higher you do on an LSAT score or any standardized test score, likely you're going to have a higher IQ. The irony, the higher IQ you have, that then brings about the question, why the hell would you want to go to law school? No offense, and I know some good lawyers, all two of them. Most lawyers are scumbags. They're amoral. Their lives suck. Their careers suck. They're not happy. They may have a lot of money, uh, but why? And why would you want to go to law school on top of it? It's a pain in the ass. Uh, these are not a group of happy, fun people. You know, you, I, I go to like the toy store, and those are happy, fun people with happy lives, even though they maybe make thirty thousand dollars a year. Lawyers, I have not seen a more miserable group of people. Maybe physicians, um, but I have not seen a more, well, professors too. But man, it, it is, and, and not to mention, you got to sell your soul for most of this stuff. Uh, so if you want to, if you get an IQ of, you know, 110, 120, 130, 
you can do whatever you want. Go be an engineer. You'll make just as much money, probably more, if you take out the tier one schools and the, the tier, top tier market. You, you make it, become a CPA, become a doctor, go do something that's productive and helpful to society, and you'll feel good about yourself. Not to mention you're not gonna be banging out 10 to 20 hours a day, and then you don't get to see your family, you don't get to go hang out with your friends. Um, there's so much more you can do. Once you get above that 110 IQ, you could kind of do anything you want. So I arbitrarily put the, I, the cutoff at 110. And if you don't think, oh, it was arbitrarily, I also wrote a book on IQ. It's called Curse of the High IQ. So I'm not exactly pulling this out of my ass. But if you're that smart and you have this potential for raw intelligence, uh, 110 and above, gosh almighty, go into engineering, Go become a doctor, go become a CPA, go become a mechanic, go become a welder, go become a tradesman, go into the military. You're, you're too smart to go into law school is what I'm saying, all right? Unless you're in that, you know, like if, if you had a perfect LA, LSAT score, like a really high LSAT score, that indicates you probably have a penchant for law. And then maybe you, you're one of the few people that should think about going in and only if you get into a tier 14 because you're, you'd make a good lawyer. Right? It's your calling. But let's say you score a, a 150 on the LSAT, but you got an IQ of 130. Well, you're a genius. You just, the LSAT is not your cup of tea. Go into engineering, become a nuclear physicist, go, go do something valuable for society and not drag it down. All right? So that's, that's what I would say. Three, does working as a paralegal during law school count as a legal internship? One in which a firm would consider a basis for potentially hiring someone as a lawyer and associate. I didn't know, so I looked it up, and it is a resounding no. I quote, who, who is this from? I forgot to get the site. No. Although the duties of the two jobs may sometimes overlap, the purpose of the law school internship is different. A law, to, a law school internship, when it's done right, is specifically designed to give the law student experiences that will help them turn into a lawyer. The intern is assigned entry-level lawyer tasks rather than paralegal tasks. And you're going to see this is a common recurring theme. Paralegal work is not lawyer work. They're two separate skill sets. And receives guidance and feedback on each assignment because the internship is designed to be an educational experience. The intern is or should be assigned a variety of tax tasks rather than performing tasks they are already familiar with over and over again so that they will learn new skills. The intern or should be the intern is or should be assigned tasks that will require the intern to apply the legal research, writing, and legal reasoning skills they have learned in law school. The intern is or should be mentored individually by one or more attorneys from the office. Paralegal jobs don't have these characteristics. So no, uh, you you, you might as well not work as a paralegal. There's no reason to. You need that internship as as a law intern, not a paralegal. Four, is it ever worth attending law school part-time? Will the cost be more or less overall? Um, it's going to be... Get it done and over with is a short version, short answer to that. And, and the reasons are many. One, there's reputations. There are very few tier one schools that offer a part-time program. When I looked it up, and, and even this, you're going to have to call them and double check because, you know, things could have changed. Georgetown, George Washington, and Fordham. It was the only ones. The fact so few... Tier 1 schools offer part-time programs should indicate that we're getting back to this prestige thing now uh, that, ew. So, hey, Thaddeus, you got a freaking monocle. Thaddeus, did you know Bobby Bobson attended night school? Oh, perish the thought, Chaz. And I'd like to say I'm spoofing it, but it, I'm getting that impression. I already kind of knew this about law, um, but there is a ton of of prestige and reputation and arrogance that goes into, into law school. Um, so the fact that so few highly ranked schools offer uh, part-time position or part-time programs is an indication that that's going to be a mark against you. Whereas, you know, you want to go to a crappy university. We got William Mitchell, we got Hamlin, and we got the University of Minnesota right down the street, well, down south. Um, <laughs> and they're crap schools. They're just crap. They have night programs because they want your freaking money. Um, I'm joking. I know two people that got hired after graduating from the U of M Law School. 
Uh, beep, 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 beep. So you want to check in, you know, like, hey, you get accepted to Michigan. Call them and see if they got a part-time program. Uh, but the real reason is more economic uh, when it comes to law school, and that's inflation, tuition inflation. If you're going to amortize your education over seven to eight years because you're just mailing it in, kind of going part-time, it's not going to impress any employers, especially if you want to get into law where they're like, oh, you weren't serious. You, you didn't do 80 hours a week studying and sleeping and studying and sleeping. Uh, you kind of went part-time your lax of days ago. We don't know if you want that. You, you're signaling something to potential employers. Uh, but then my concern is inflation. Dude, do you know how much inflation keeps, is going to, and it's going to keep going up. It's going to keep going up because we just don't spend enough money on education, meaning we don't lend enough money and there's, we need more scholarships and your parents should get you more money. And little do you realize that you know, doubling, tripling, quadrupling, quintupling the money going into the education market doubles, triples, quintuples, quintiples uh, the price of tuition. So it, it, I can only see the cost of law school going up. And if, now some law schools have closed because they're not able to get the students. So maybe maybe prices will come down here a little bit. Uh, but don't, yeah, either, either go full time or not is the general simple rule. Uh, five, all things equal, does a part, let me, did I get, yep, okay, five, all things equal, does a part-time law JD differ from full-time law JD uh, with respect to being hired? Yes, again, because of the reputation. Yes, again, because so few highly ranked schools offer them. Um, and then yes, again, because of that prestige and the reputation and the arrogance. It just, that's the impression I got. Kind of night schools because they're lowbrow. Unless your name's Chaz or Thaddeus. We gotta come up with some some fancy girls named Patricia? No, it's not. What are they what are they what are, they, what are like the blue blood women called Hillary? <laughs> Alright. Uh Chelsea. <laughs> oh god, I'm funny. Okay, law school. Is it, is it ever worth attending a tier four law school? Hell no. No. Did you? No. No. Don't. Is it even worth attending an RNP law school? Say, what's RNP? RNP is ranked, not published. Now, let's explain this, and then you can maybe answer this question yourself. U.S. World and News Report. They're the authoritative on what the ranking of the schools are, and the tiers are determined and all that. And they send out a survey, and they get the responses back from the law schools, and then they rank them. They rank all of them. Some of them they choose not to publish, specifically the bottom 25%. The reason they don't publish the bottom 25% is so they don't get sued, is what I'm predicting. I just say, like, we better not put them in the bottom 25. So they only publish the top 75% of schools, and they don't mention the bottom quartile. Uh, so now you tell me if it's so shameful, they don't mention them. They rank them, but they don't mention them. Do you think you should attend freaking no-name college, uh, school of law? Uh, so it's a double hell no. You do not, uh, you don't attend fourth. You don't attend third. Three and below, no. There you go, there's your chant. Three and below, hell no. Three and below, hell no. And then you guys can go march on Wall Street. Uh, do you believe including the GRE and lowering... Do you believe including the GRE and lowering SAT admission standards is correlated to the law school's bottom line? Oh, yeah, of course. Absolute. Okay. There's two general markets occurring here. Your, your top end are your Tiffany Diamond type. Of, we're going to have low volume, but we're going to charge them up the yin-yang. High, pro, high profit margins. And then on the other end is kind of your Walmarts. We're going to make that much money, but we're going to get a ton of volume. All right, now... Um, on the low end law schools, it's, they, they don't charge Walmart. They don't charge as much as um, Harvard or Yale, they, but they charge a lot. So they have very handsome margins. So how do they make more money? Get those kids through the schools. They're Pell Grant sponges. They're degree mills. Oh, they may be accredited, but you know, barely so. But they are just bringing you kids through. And so absolutely, they and this is, this is every college and university. I remember when you had to apply, you had to meet standards. They get accepted to the University of Minnesota. Now it's like, yeah, you got to apply and you got to meet standards, but the standards are way lower. And we're going to talk about this later. This is poses a specific threat 
uh, to women and minorities. I know this is intended for women, but let's talk about women and minorities here. Where we're going to do affirmative action and we're going to lower the standards. Okay, so minorities, women, they may not do so well on the math or the LSAT or the GRE. Oh, hey, you got in. Do you want to get in? You want to talk about affirmative action having the complete opposite effect. Like, yeah, you got into law school, but now you're crippled in debt. And you can't find a, a job because you went to a tier four. This is a huge threat, huge threat to women and minorities, which I'm going to address later. But that's horrible. That's horrible because, you know, they're not going to lower it over at Harvard or Yale. Uh, but at Bob's Law School at the strip mall, oh yeah, they'll lower it, and then you can have the honor of paying $43,000 to, to attend Bob's Law School. You can get your degree in PDF. Um, nine, should you listen to law school exes, professors, current student? Oh, should you listen to law school exes, meaning some law school, professors, current students, affiliated employees regarding statistics, salaries, or prospects when deciding to attend law school? Why or why not? Let me ask you this, if, if majority of ladies. Ladies, should you listen to me about whether you should date me? No! <laughs> I, I go to the dealership. Hey, should I listen to them about whether I should buy their car? They're in it to make money. There's 100% buy. Look, okay, your professors and the employees, they have a vested interest. The students who are going there, even the ones that are graduated, they're so drunk with ego and agency. Not to mention, uh, if they have graduated and not finding jobs, they have buyer's remorse, and so they cannot admit that they wasted well, you throw in high school, 13, it, seven, 20 years. They wasted 20 years of their life, seven of it in college, three of that in, in law school. And Lord knows how much money. And, and then you look at it, most of them have nothing else in their lives. I mean, nothing. Uh, they, they cannot say, I would never do it again. So there's this huge ego, buyer's remorse. If you don't know what buyer's remorse is, look it up, because you're going to have it when you go to these colleges. Um. So they're going to lie to protect their own ego. Uh, and then when you look, you know, salaries and pro Oh, dude, every school lies about st Oh, my God, it is such a joke. I went to the Carlson School of Management, and they were publishing their figures on how much they were making. And then me and my buddy started, like, because we were graduating some head office. I said, did you get any who's the Who's making that much? I don't know anyone making that much. And, it's and uh, yeah, the statistics can be easily manipulated. Um... I would not, no, don't go to the horse's mouth to ask the horse if it should be fed more hay, all right? Don't go to Aaron Clary asking him if you should date him, especially if you're a good-looking redhead, all right? Because I may give you bi bias advice. I may. And I may not have your best interests in mind. I almost like guarantee you I only would have my interests in mind. So, no, there's, there's no reason um, to I, I throw it out. Throw it out. Go with the rankings, okay? Go with the rankings. Ten. The average debt of law school students is $84,000 for public universities, $124,000 private, respectively. How much would a student's salary need to be in order to service this debt within 10 years? What is the minimum monthly payment? Now, the problem with this question is it's impossible to say because it depends on how much you spend. You know, are you going to be like every other tier three, four, uh, even low rank two and go buy yourself a Mercedes that you can't afford and now be equally indebted as the tier one law graduates? Uh, are you going to buy fancy clothes and keep up the facade? I know, I know, more than one partner at somewhat prestigious law firms that make a lot of money and they spend it all. They still have their student loan debts from 20 freaking years ago. <laughs> I don't know how, but they do. Well, I know how they spend more than they make. So it's, what I've done is I reversed it. Uh, as, and, and this is really rough math because, again, it's like, where do you live? What's your rent? And this is very rough. But I did some calculations, um, you know, how long can you expect to pay it off? How long do you, can you expect it to be paid off? If you have just had $30,000 in living expenses, the interest rate is 6.8% on law school loans, and the public school, the public lawyers who attended public school, they will face a 30% tax rate, and the high-end lawyers will face a 40% tax rate, right? So there's just some key things. Median income for public lawyers public school lawyers, is $55,000. That's right, $55,000. Think about that. Don't secretary or paralegals make $50,000? It's like, yes! And they only got their associates. Who's looking smarter now? 
And then if you went to a private school, the tier, top tier school, you have $160,000 median income, three times the amount as the public, lawyer, public school lawyers. So you do the math and the amortization, I won't bore you with it. <clears throat> and here's what it boils down to. It will take the public school lawyers 17 years to pay off their debts. And that's assuming you throw all your money <laughs> into loan repayment. If you're in the tier one law, you know, you're the, the private school law and you graduate there on average two years and change, two years, two months, two years and a quarter. Um, Cause you're just making that much more money and you can pay down, even though you incurred more debt, you're paying it down a lot faster. 11, many soon to be lawyers believe public service will bail them out of, with loan forgiveness after 20 years. Are there IRS taxes associated with loan forgiveness and income programs? I love how all the students, now think about this, think about this. You, you Do you hate the banksters? You remember how the tax, you, you don't like the taxpayers bailing out the bankers? How is it any different what you're asking for right now? And, and here's the thing, you're gonna be a parasite. Do you wanna be a parasite? Take, no politics, no economic, math. You're having people, you, I'll pay you back, give me your money. You took the money and now the taxpayers are gonna get their money back. It's going to be forgiven. Ah, yeah, you'll serve and you'll help out and da-da-da. Uh, but let's be very clear what that says about you. You are no better than the bankers that were bailed out. All right? So we got the moral lesson there. Uh, so, But the good news for those of you that want to go down that route, no. Uh, lo law school loans are not taxed. The, or the forgiveness is not taxed. So you know what? Sometimes when, you're, when you get a loan forgiven, you gotta, that's treated as income on your taxes. This is not the case. Um, loan, uh, the law school loan repayment assistant programs are not taxed. 12, please explain to all law students what bimodal distribution is, how it directly correlates to what they can expect to make, and why law schools advertise these numbers. Um, well, it depends. The high-ranked law schools will advertise bimodal distribution. The low-ranked law schools will just do mean. They won't even mention distribution. Uh, so remember that how the public school lawyers make $55,000 and the median income for the high-end private school lawyers make $160,000? That's bimodal. Most statistical distributions, that's what we're talking about, statistical distributions, have the bell curve. LSAT scores, IQ, height, weight. What else? Uh, the average daily temperature. Everything has this natural thing. And, but then in some places there isn't. There's bimodal, meaning two bells. So there's one bell and two bells. And on the left side, which would be your right side, but I'm going to do it from my perspective, on the low end, so you have salary here from zero to infinity, there's that bump where all the people went to public school and they on average make $55,000. Then it drops down and then it goes up again where all the um, uh, the private lawyers, the tier one, the, the, the good ones, not morally, just better at being a lawyer than you are, uh, they make on average 160000 and it drops out. And what they'll do, what law schools will do is manipulate the statistics. So the mean average is I think 118000 for all lawyers, the, the mean average, you add up all the lawyers, you take the average, lawyers on average make 118,000. They don't tell you that unless, that it's these guys over here making the 160 and change pulls the average way up. And unless you got into the Thaddeus McThaddeus Stevenson the fourth and Chadwick the fifth school of uh, law, uh, you, this is the world that you're facing where it's $55,000. And once again, I, I don't care how many years of schooling you got. You can make a lot more as a mechanic, a good-looking bartender, a good-looking waitress, uh, or just a really good babysitter. Um, so that's what bimodal distribution is. And you can look it up. Look, Google search bimodal distribution lawyer salaries, and you'll see it. It's, it's painful as day. Uh, 13, if law school is not a financially good idea, what would you suggest females with the specific attorney, lawyer, employment skill set look into for job prospects? Well, it's not, and this isn't just females, but anybody. Uh, I would say accounting. That's that's logically the best one um, because you're you're clerical, you're logical. It's an office job, um, and then for a fraction of the effort and time, you can become a CPA and make more than the average lawyer does. All right, not not average. I'll take the the elites out. Way more, double. All right, 
and for a fraction of, of, of the amount of schooling. Yes, you might have to take some master's courses. Some states still, you could just get your bachelor's degree in accounting, uh, and then you test for your CPA, and then you get your CPA. You gotta work in accounting for a little bit. Uh, but I would strongly encourage, the vast majority of law students right now, you don't go into law. You look at becoming a CPA. Um, if you have the penchant for statistics, maybe actuarial science, is another one that you guys could think of. But I, I, don't, I don't believe in this, like, well, I have a lawyer skill set. I have an accounting skill No. Do you work hard? The human brain can learn anything, right? Unless you're mentally impaired, you can do whatever you want. Not to sound like Dr. Brown from uh, Back to the Future. But you can't, right? And this pigeonholing women and like, well, you should be lawyers and social workers and teachers. No. How about you become engineers? How about you become mechanics? How about you become uh, welders? How about, you know, anything that pays, don't limit it, you know, give it a shot. Well, I don't know if I'd like it, but you haven't tried it. How do you know? Take a class, figure it out. So uh, a logical would be accounting and um, uh, actuarial science. No, you're not gonna get your MBA. Your MBA is just as worthless. I could do another video on MBAs about how pointless and worthless they are. But you, uh, you need a skill. You need a skill of some kind, and I'd say accounting. And I, 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 not to play sexism or anything. Like that, I think women are better accountants in general because they audit better. They're more attentive to detail. Because, because my girlfriend, God, 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 go be an accountant. Get out of here. Yes, my socks are on the floor. Go away. Go work for Pete Marwick. God damn it. <laughs> You're smiling, knock it off. All right. Um, oh, in the military, that's another thing, military. Military, check that out, all right? You already have your, if you're already looking at law school, that means you've got a bachelor's degree. Military, you become an officer. Nothing wrong with enlisted, but something to consider. Okay, next group of questions. The correlation. Do law firms use paralegals and legal assistants enrolled in law school for free access to resources they are granted as law students, i.e. Lexus, Nexus, Westlaw. I'm sure they do. I'm sure they do. Um, I, somewhere that's happening. I don't know where, but somewhere I'm sure it's happening. Uh, however, what what's probably a little bit more legal and common is public libraries offer uh, those legal services uh, at a discount. Uh, you still have to pay, but you can go online and subscribe through your library. Uh, but I'm sure if, if they have a, a paralegal uh, who's majoring in law, I'm, I'm sure they do. Uh, two, do law firms hire paralegals, legal assistants, or attend law school who wish to be employed with the firm after they graduate? Why or why not? Uh, not anymore, uh, those who don't. It, again, revisit the law. Paralegal work is not lawyer work and vice versa. Uh, they're not necessarily against it, uh, but it doesn't give you a leg up. So again, if you want to become a lawyer, become a lawyer. Don't become a paralegal. Separate skill sets. Same industry, separate skill, uh, skill sets, right? So, you know, it's like, it's almost the impression I almost got is if you were working in a mechanic shop, you have the secretary or the cashier or somebody up front doing the accounting and then you have the mechanics like, well, they could do each other's job. No, they can't. No, they can't. Two separate skill sets. Two separate skill sets. Um, now, there's a panel. Harvard Law, they did a panel on this. Law school lowdown. Should you be a paralegal prior to attending law school? Look that up. It, it basically, the conclusion is no. Just just don't. Uh, because, it, again, you're, you're telepathing and signaling, well, I'm going to do this. And then, you know, Principals and partners and law firms like, well, I don't want that. I want a lawyer. I don't want a lawyer. I want a paralegal. So, you know, if you want to be a lawyer, be a lawyer. If you want to be a paralegal, be a paralegal. Don't be both. Uh, fourth or fifth set of questions, law and other. <clears throat> One, is there a gender, race, age correlation in legal firms hiring practices? In other words, you firms tend to hire male, female, or show equal preference. Is there a correlation which associates actually make Partners. All right, I tried looking into this dude, and here's here's what you can expect. It okay? You could have predicted this. 
Everybody's being discriminated against. Oh my God, it's horrible. Minorities, females, age, whatever you get. Every, every study coming out of academia shows there's this horrible discrimination. Problem is, I no longer trust academia. I don't trust college and university studies because it's now, it's, it's, a, it's a scam. It's a racket. Everybody's oppressed. We need more money or we need lower standards. All right, so I'm done with it. I did something that was a little bit more empirical, uh, however, less scientific, because I was kind of like, I want to know. And what I did is I just went to these sites, because they can't wait to put their pictures up. And I looked at the partners. Right? I did it for international firms. I did it for a local firm in Minneapolis, uh, in Minneapolis, local firms in Minneapolis. Problem is, didn't know if you knew, there's tons of white people here in Minneapolis, not exactly representative necessarily of the whole country. Then I went down to LA in Houston and checked out a whole bunch, and I just looked at pictures. God damn, for 30 minutes, I just looked at pictures. And so there's basically two things you, you, could, you could kind of pull from it. One, there's the partners, the people that own it. Well, these guys are predominantly guys, but they're all old. And then two, the, the lawyers, if they had their pictures up, were more representative of uh, the uh, population demographics in the towns that they were. So it kind of makes sense. Uh, at the top, you got old fuddy die. I mean, these guys are at least 50 and up. And they're predominantly white guys. Um, next largest prop, uh, representative group were women. Um, but they didn't account for more than a third, certainly not more than a third. Although, depending on the age of the law firm itself, some law firms are headed up by younger partners. And there you saw more diversity, all right? And again, adjusting for population demographics and all that. Then, when you just see the rank and file lawyers, if they provided pictures, again, a little bit more diversity, but based on what I looked in population, not representative uh, of the population. Still, I would say a little bit more, uh, or an underrepresentation of blacks, Hispanics, women not so much. There are a lot of women. Women are represented significantly, I'd say, in the lawyer ranks, maybe not partner ranks, although there are significant representation up there. But it's, uh, if anyone is represented proportionally to their population, it'd be East Indians, Asians, perhaps even more so. And there'd be a, a dearth or a, a disproportionately lower representation of blacks and Hispanics. Women, though, were all over the place. And I think we're starting to see that as, as women now account for the majority of, of law students. They're definitely represented in, in, in the lawyer pictures. Um, the problem, though, is this gets back to... You know, let's lower the standards, or hey, let's get my, oh my gosh, and they always had diversity right up there, first thing, forget legal services, diversity, first thing, and it's like, hey, okay, good, you're all for diversity, all right, that doesn't mean you guys should be going to law school, all right, and this is, this is the point, um, is there discrimination, no, I'm, I'm thinking, because I just, I don't, everyone is on, walking on eggshells, I don't believe it, I don't believe anyone's going to discriminate against you. I think it's just scare, scaremongering tactics. Um, where's it going with this? Oh, it's what percentage of the people are actually attending law school. So we can look at the proportion of the population. Um, I'd have to find out, okay, in this area, what percentage of the law students are this gender or this race or that ethnicity? And I, I don't have the time or the money for that. Uh, but I'm just, I would have to say that no, there's probably not any discrimination. If there is discrimination, I read a couple articles that link to actual studies and research, but again, I don't really necessarily trust studies, where in some of the upper echelons, there's a little bit of a bias that goes to the men. And the reason for that is the women want to have it all. They're the Some of these law, law firms are worried about hiring a gal who is then going to go have kids and not bang out 80 hours a week. So, I mean, it, it's either you're going to commit to that law firm in your legal profession or have kids, not one or the other. Uh, still, there's pretty significant representation, but we're, when we're talking about getting to the tier one and everyone's really serious and they're doing it, uh, you're talking big bucks, you're talking big egos, you're talking a lot of arrogance, and the partners of the firm are like, uh, no, we need you here 100 hours a week, and that's nice you, you want to have kids and family, uh, but no, Marissa Meyer, 
you, you're not the CEO, so we're going to go with Phil. I'm sorry, Chaz. Chaz. So, I, uh, in general, uh, for those of you who are concerned about uh, discrimination in whatever its form is, I, I wouldn't. I mean, please look at these studies, no matter what it is, and see if it really is. Because what you'll find, you'll read these studies, and it suggests, even though the numbers didn't come, it's, there's a potential. So I don't give a damn if there's a potential or suggests. If you want to be a lawyer, go be a lawyer. You want to be a mechanic, go be a mechanic. Don't let whatever you were born with, what plumbing you got, affect that or not. Um, so it's maybe, maybe, maybe women might face a touch of discrimination. Um, but for the most part, it, it, look, they were, you know, people aren't against hiring minorities. They're not against hiring women. There just may not be that much interest in those various groups to become lawyers. And here's the other th final thing. You don't want to go to law school. <laughs> if you haven't figured out, the conclusion is they're doing you a favor. So if you think that there's going to be some discrimination, I'm going to show you how there is actually some discrimination, but it's not coming from the sectors you think. And it's way more malicious and vile than you think. They might be doing you a favor having you not go into law school and indebting yourself and then working miserable jobs and being miserable with your life. It may be in your best interest to be discriminated out of this, right? Kind of like, yeah, I didn't date the, the high school cheerleader. Thank God, because she turned into a wreck because she discriminated against me because I was short and ugly. Imagine that me. Now I'm just, now I'm just ugly and I'm still short. All right. What is the employment outlook for attorneys? Uh, according to the BLS, over the next 10 years, 8%. That's on average. That's uh, average growth, one and a quarter, I think is the math on that one. One and a twelfth. Not booming. So they're estimating 65,000 jobs over the next 10 years or 6,500 jobs. So, yeah, okay, it's growing. It's growing. All right, that's good. All right. Do you know how many people graduate from law school every year? Okay, let's do some math. I know you guys are law students. You're very smart and very intelligent. You scored very high on, high on the LSATs. So let's see if we can do some division. There are 6,500 new jobs coming out according to the BLS, which admittedly is likely to be wrong. But 6,500. And there are 34,000 new graduates a year. That's five times the amount of jobs. This is why you're going to find on later questions Everyone who has their JD are applying for jobs like paralegals and nonprofits and charity work. I have never seen such a lopsided labor market in my life. And they don't tell you this. This is probably the most important statistic in this entire presentation. There are five times the amount of lawyers being graduated than there are jobs being created each year. And that surplus adds up. All right? So that's another. Again. Ooh, did they discriminate at law firm? Do, do you want to go swim? Do you want to go get, like, are they discriminating on the Titanic? You know the Titanic's going to sink. They may push you away because of race, creed, color, or skin. Be thankful. Be very, very thankful. Three, uh, contrast how to graduate from, how a graduate from a tier one will find a JD required job and how a graduate from a tier three will find a JD required job. How would uh, ranked not published graduates find a JD required job? All right, tier one, it's very easy how they will find jobs. You will be actively recruited. Yes, you might have to send out some resumes. Yes, you have to go to some meetings and hobnob and network, but your, your, your dad should line you up with a job if you're in tier one. That's how it works, okay? Tier three, you will have to job hunt. Not just job hunt, you have to like beg, plead, grovel, donate blood, offer favors, and ultimately settle for lower pay. Again, tier three, not, not, you don't want to go, tier one or two, that's it. Tier three, no, 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 you don't, you don't do tier three. We don't do that. So you're going to have to self-employ. Um, you're going to be one of those shitberg ambulance chasing type of crap lawyers. Um, yeah, you, you don't want to, and then uh, rank not published, you're, you're not, you're not, you're just not going to find a job. Don't tell me, I know one guy who graduated, he got, okay, all right, that's one guy and good for him, I'm, I'm, that's luck, but for the remaining 99.8% of you, don't go to a rank not published school. You're not going to find, well, I can't guarantee that, the statistics are against you that you will find a job. So you're going to be working nonprofit, charity, donating your time, you ain't going to be generating the money to pay back those law loans. 
Uh, so, you know, there's some hope that maybe you can find what's called JD Advantage, where you don't pass the bar, you don't have to pass the bar. They employ you not as a lawyer, but for your legal background and education. <clears throat> Which is the next question, four. What is day, JD Advantage? As an economist, can this be applied in the current economy? What are a few, if any, jobs that JD Advantage can actually be applied to? This is one of the few, take that back, this is the only bright light in the entire world of law and law school. Uh, JD Advantage jobs means that it, it really helps or it's required that you have your Juris Doctorate, uh, your law degree. Just because you get a law degree doesn't mean you pass the bar and then go practice law. So whether you have your, you pass the bar exam or not, uh, the fact you have a JD makes you employable in software in some fields that aren't necessarily related to law. Uh, 2015, I think the date was, 15% of new graduates were hired for their JD advantage, not the fact they passed the bar exam. So the, this is a good sign. There is demand, and significant demand of 15%. That's more than an eighth. Sixth, did I do the math right? Sixth, yes, a sixth. Sixth and change. Um, with this diversification of employment, you don't have to go to big law. You don't have to go work at a legal department over at a corporation. You don't have to go work in the judicial system. There are other uh, demands for your education and expertise that isn't exactly being a lawyer. It requires that you pass the bar exam. So, and he wants to know um, what type of jobs, you know, what kind of jobs can you apply to? It, it was wide ranging. You could do legal counsel, administration, generally business management or some kind of managerial thing. Employment, professors, uh, law school staff. I find that rich and hilarious that those who can't do teach, like you went to law and you go and you teach at the same school that just screwed you over. <laughs> uh, but there is some demand for people with it. And look, much as I say I'm on law school, it's more of a function of oversupply and limited demand. People go to law school and you finish it, you ain't no dummy. So again, that's signaling to the market that you, well, you could do other stuff too. You probably are good at business, or at least business management. So that's, that's one good hope, but don't bank on that. Um, again, you'll be a lot better off with an accounting degree and a CPA, because that's a specific skill. Five, can tier four law school graduates expect to eventually be picked up if they just never give up the legal job search? Is it the same for ranked not published law schools? No, and definitely no. Not, stop, stop with the hope. Stop with the hope. I know you guys all, it's your dream, and frankly, it's all you got. It's all you've ever done. Too bad you wasted your time. Stop, stop. I mean, sure, go, go have a recruiter try and find you a job. Check in with your recruiter. Maybe, maybe the blind squirrel will find an acorn. But you have got to be working on a plan B now to get out of your student loan debts and come up with a skill or a career or a profession that's not going to pay off your debts but support you and hopefully build up enough money that you'll have enough to retire and not die eating beans. It's, your youth is over. It's gone. It's done. Stop wasting time. Right? So that's, I, I'm, you know, yeah, you got it. Yeah, go ahead. Throw, throw some lines in the water. But your chances are very low. Six, some JDs who graduate from no-name law schools advocate that in order to get their foot in the door, one should volunteer and work for free. Is this a good idea? No, it's not a good idea. You're a slave now. Love how... Typically, law students lean left, and you're all against slavery, but then you'll go and do it. You have some self-respect, all right? Unless they like, yeah, we need a lawyer, and we will hire you. Okay, but otherwise, what I see a lot of, ironically, is nonprofits in these political organizations saying, well, you can come work for us for free. You can volunteer. You can get experience. Oh. No. No. Not to curse, but Robert De Niro's famous quote from Casino, F you pay me. Right? You wasted that much time getting a, essentially a doctorate. Uh, and now people are asking you to volunteer? No. Pay me. Heck, go into business for yourself. That's the, the least you can do. I mean, that, uh, before, before I go donate time for a nonprofit, <clears throat> I'll, I'll open up my own shop. And you might as well do that. Um, will it get your foot in the door? Every, it's possible. Everything's possible. Uh, but I... I I've never seen anything good come from volunteer work. 
I know you, you got nice, warm, fluffy bunnies, and you, you built a house for Habitat for Humanity. I've never seen concrete success for the participants or the beneficiaries long term come from volunteer work. It's a temporary band-aid on a problem, and you're not, you know, it looks all right on your resume, maybe. I wouldn't make it your job. Um, <clears throat> seven, please explain document review, known as also known as doc review, or e-discovery now, as it's called. Jobs for JDs. Does document review after law school affect employment prospects on an application? All right, let's explain. Um, obviously, there's a lot of documents that go into law. And for purposes of what can be submitted as evidence, um, the opposing lawyer also has a right, I think it's discovery, I could be wrong, I don't know the term. They have a right to see what you have as evidence to contest whether or not it should be allowed into the court as evidence. Um, there's other re legal reasons that you got to go over and review all these documents. Now a technology is called e-discovery because you can just edit, search, find. Um, and that's what you do, you just search over documents looking for things that are germane or relevant or pertinent to the case at hand. Uh, and then, you know, because you could have thousands of pages, you know, especially corporate lawsuit, oh my gosh, you know. So everything's scanned and it's digitized and you just search, you search, 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 search. And uh, that's boring work. And the lawyer who's representing the case don't have time to do that. So they usually have document review specialists uh, do that. Um, I didn't know, uh, so I had to look it up. Uh, one, it pays $50,000 a year. Once again, a good-looking bartender or an attractive wait waitress will make more. So I looked into it, and it's pretty conclusive. Yes, it will negatively affect your employment. This is from the Document Review blog. Quote, there are a lot of things to consider when deciding whether or not to become a document review attorney. Yes, it is true that many firms don't consider document review to be a real attorney work, and as such, they are wary of hiring people who only have document review work on the resume. If you're fresh out of law school and looking to become a practicing lawyer at a small firm, a month or two of document re review work to pay the bills will probably not hurt your chances. However, many people claim that once you start with document review jobs, you will never be considered by a firm for a true position, especially for large law firms. Quite a few document review jobs do not allow you the time to research for new jobs or search for new jobs or to take time off to interview, which makes it harder to find a job to get out of the document review business, leading to what some call the document review trap. Many people on East Coast on the East Coast are finding themselves in such traps because of the large number of law schools turning out lawyers many of whom sometimes cannot pass a bar. With so many law school graduates, law firm law firm jobs with so many law school graduates, law firm jobs are very hard to find, and those that are here, may, those that are there, may not pay the bills, aka student loans and high cost of living. A large pool of graduates also depresses document review wages and allows agencies to pick and choose their workers, leading to many people accusing East Coast agencies and firms of abuse. And this is, I'm going to make this point now. When you get such a lopsided labor market, um, where there's five times the applicants as there is jobs, it's one thing for employers to demand extra work or demand, but I've seen, I saw this in banking, especially during recessions. Uh, human nature is sadistic. It's dark. It's disgusting, and these people. A lot of them, especially in law, especially in banking and finance, these people get off on torturing others and making other people's lives miserable. They're, they're sadists. These, they're, the default setting for humans, especially in banking and law, are sadists. And they will make you dance. And it goes beyond any kind of economic sense. Like, why are you having him fetch coffee? Why are you doing that? Because they want to. Why are you, why are you yelling at guy because he hates his wife He wants to take it out on you? <laughs> And I've seen it, man. I've seen it. So not only can you expect a hard job hunt and low pay or no pay or volunteer work or maybe I'll become paralegal, you can expect your bosses to be complete pricks because they get off on it. And it is that simple. It's disgusting and gross, but you will see it firsthand. And I guarantee you there'll be people in the comments section below who will attest to it. <clears throat> a new lawyer from the East Coast should think long and hard about their career goals before making a decision about document reviews. Hey, please explain the chances of a law school JD reverting back to a job as a paralegal 
or a legal assistant as a backup. All right, it's very low. Again, paralegals are not lawyers. Lawyers are not paralegals. And uh, the research I've shown has uh, did shows that most partners in law firms will not hire JDs at paralegals. Uh, not only because of the different skill set, um, there's a concern that you're going to bolt for a job if you ever do get a job as a lawyer. Uh, and then it's oil and water. Um, when you take a JD and throw them in with the paralegals, a lot of these JDs think they know it all because they got their degree in law, and it's all ego. It's all ego. That's all they have is their, their degree. And then and here's these stupid women making more than they are, and they only went to school for two years or not at all. They're like, you don't know what you're doing, da, da, da. And you got this know-it-all attitude where it's like, shut up. You're a damn failure. Treat these women and men with respect and just do your job. And no, you're not going to do it. They know what they're doing. And so uh, people are afraid to hire JDs as paralegals for those reasons. Nine, how does this affect women who graduate law school, who graduate from? Guys, you got to put from. Put the prepositional phrase from. You don't graduate high school. You don't graduate college. You graduate from college. Graduate from high school. <clears throat> how does this affect women who graduate from law school with the hopes of settling down? All right. Paralegal or not, I, it affects it negatively. Look, gals, it, and he's intending this for women. I'm also going to point this out for guys. If you want to have children, if you want to be a stay-at-home mother, if you want to be a wife, there's nothing wrong with that. There's been a tremendous amount, especially amongst those ladies who are attending law school or going into the liberal arts and with the path of going to law school. To make it seem that uh, being a mother or a stay-at-home mom is not real work, it's a real job, just spend time with kids, you'll find out, uh, there is nothing wrong or shameful, no matter what people have told you about wanting to be a stay-at-home mom and raising some kids. And what I've found as I've gotten older and got a little bit of gray is that deep down inside, that's what most women want. Now, again, a lot of women do also want to go and have a career. I'm not begrudging you that. Go and have your career. Go ahead and do that. But know thine self. Stefan Molyneux always says, know thine self. But I think he's quoting Aristotle or somebody else who's long dead. Um, be honest with yourself. Do you want, is that what you want? Is that, when you say, what do I want out of life? And if it includes being a wife and having kids, well, guess what? Don't go to law school, Okay because it is really going to hurt your chances. One, you're, you've already gone to school until you're 22, at the youngest, <clears throat> for an undergrad. Let's assume you, you bummed around and tried this and tried that, and you know, I'm going to go back to law school. Oh, there's another three years. Now you're, you're in your mid to late 20s, uh, and you got some time left uh, to, to go and date and court and maybe find a husband, and that unto itself is going to take some time. But then you're going to work, let's say you're lucky, and you end up getting a law, and now you got to work your career. Well, now you're 30, 32, and this may not, I know, this is, this is truth. Guys are more interested in a 25-year-old than they are a 30-year-old. And you could call that cheap and da-da-da-da-da. That's genetics. That's biology. Terribly sorry. Right? And so now you're ticking up against the time clock where it's like, oh, you're 30. All right, how actively are you going to date? Do you have time to even date? That's another uh, problem I've seen with some of because most of my friends now are my age. I'm in my 40s, and these gals, they, they can't have it. Well, they can. <clears throat> it's risky, but they don't have time. They're not going to have kids. So be honest with yourself. Do you want to have a family? Because if you do, it's not antithetical. Law school is not antithetical. But boy, it really makes it hard uh, to, to settle down and raise a family. All right, so if you want to settle down and raise a family, do that. Then, when the kids are, you know, first grade or whatever, they're kind of off, I know, then go back to law school. Then go do that, right? That, it's almost the same time commitment. Well, it's less of a time commitment to raise two kids relatively close born to each other from birth to when the youngest is off to school than it is to go to college, law school, and then, you know, paying back your student loans, and then you go get married. So there's a logic in the chronology here. Law school will always be there. Don't worry. They're not going anywhere. Some are going bankrupt, but there will be law schools. And you will always be able to major in law. But if you want to have kids, it's better to do it on the younger side of things than the older side of things. Um, so I would, yeah, you're not, um, it's, it's not helping. Oh, here's another one. Very important thing. Very important. Um, guys don't like girls with debt. I'm being perfectly honest. I, girls don't like guys with debt. 
and you come walking in there with on average $100,000 of debt and you can't find a job, you're working nonprofit or trying to become a paralegal making 50 grand a year, and you're still getting shot down? You, again, this is the real world, not what Oprah wants to tell you. Not, not, not puppies and cherries and unicorns. No. <laughs> you could be a very attractive young lady with a great personality. You got $100,000 in debt? No. And if your primary goal in life, if you were honest, you want, no, I really want to be a wife and have kids, you've just torpedoed yourself with that crippling, not just financially crippling, but dating crippling amount of debt. Right? You may not like it, that's how it is. You could say, well, men should, at that, we're not dealing in shoulda land. We deal in the real world here at Asshole Consulting, right? That's why I make good money. I'm the only one telling the truth. So before you go to law school, right, and you rack up 100000 added to whatever you had on undergrad, you got to look when a guy finds out, like, oh, what? How much? No, me and my little en my, my chemical engineering ass is getting out of here. I'm going to go find Susie Q, who uh, she's an accountant, and she has no debt. Maybe boring with the debits and credits, but no debt. So that is a, another huge deterrent to men. Uh, Ten, please explain how bankruptcy affects a person's future life moving forward. Briefly, I think most simply recognize bankruptcy as a bad thing without a solid understanding of why it's so bad. In either case, I'm paying hard-earned money for these questions. Yes, you keep reminding me. I, I, I'm aware. Uh, all right, there's two types of bankruptcy, Chapter 7, Chapter 13. Chapter 7, quote, all your debts are forgiven except those that are not dischargeable under bankruptcy, which is overdue taxes, tax liens, student loans, and some other uh, types of debt simply not dismissible. Um, <clears throat> it is on your credit report for 10 years, then it is removed. So you are crippled, crippled financially from borrowing, but well, you can borrow. You'll always find a credit card that will lend you at 36% or a fly-by-night mortgage broker that will lend you at 12%, uh, but you're gonna pay a lot more in credit uh, interest and it's gonna be hard to get qualified for good loans. Uh, the chapter 13, that's simply a reworking of your debts. You go on a new payment plan, they rework them, maybe some of it is forgiven, um, and then um, that is removed after seven years. You get that off your head. Again, kind of the same thing. Uh, it's going to be hard for you to get credit. Your interest rates are going to go up, et cetera, et cetera. The worst thing, <clears throat> the worst thing um, is that it affects your employment. Yes, obviously it affects your credit, but it's going to affect your employment. When people do a credit check on you, they're going to, oh, you're bankrupt. Now, if there was a really, really, really good, not story, but truth behind it, like, oh, my wife was dying and I had to sell the house and give blood and da, da da and then she okay that's legitimate if it's well I, I went to a no-name law school it was a, a RNP and uh, well then I had a degree in in uh, uh, philosophy and then uh, uh, I didn't work and then uh, uh, you know and then I got some credit card debt because I really want to have that beamer I got a, a car loan uh, yeah <laughs> it's gonna really affect your employment uh, and then finally, yes, it's removed from your credit score, but not expunged from the record. You, you, it's a legal filing. We can look you up. Oh, they filed for bankruptcy 20 years ago, and that will haunt you for the rest of your day. And to be honestly truthful, I will never do business or hire or have anything to do financial. I'll be friends, but I will have nothing to do financially or employment-wise with someone who filed for bankruptcy. Never. And there's a lot of people, for good reason, that won't have it to do with that either. Uh, and then here's the other, with, remember, student debt is not dischargeable in, in, in bankruptcy, right? So it, I know you're thinking about it, but, you know, go talk to a, this is, this is where it's worth hiring a bankruptcy attorney and paying $100 or $200 to have him or her take a look at your situation and tell you what to do. So don't just say, oh, I'll go file for bankruptcy. No, talk to an attorney first, pay the money. It's probably some of the best money you'll ever spend. You'll make it more back and... and legal costs and all that other stuff. Um, but yeah, I, long term, it's just a mark. It's, it's just a mark that will never go away. 11. Since the Great Recession of 2008, has the legal market improved? Yes. It's hard to get data. I was looking and there's uh, Statistica. They're like, hey, I'll give you the chart for 50 bucks. No. So I found some other research and depending on revenues and um, uh, national income production accounts over at the BLA, or BEA, um, it has recovered, uh, but just barely above its 2008 level. 
And the legal market has been going through some consolidations, uh, and it's not growing by leaps and bounds. It's only growing at one, just barely over 1% since 2012. Um, and again, the economy, the, the market's growing like this, and the number of new lawyers being graduated is this. So the law industry is in a consolidation phase, and they're just taking their pick of the litter. Only the creme de la creme, the top law schools, uh, graduates from the top law schools um, should be looking into this. Uh, and slow growth is predicted, but again, the predictions are always wrong. Uh, so it has recovered. Let's say it's recovered. It has improved, but it's not booming at all. And that was the last of his questions. All right, so here's some additional commentary for me and I'll give a conclusion here. And then I'm gonna reheat my coffee. Um, let's be very clear what's happening uh, in law school. And for those of you who are going to law school or thinking about going to law school, the problem goes back to when you were 17 or 16 and you were deciding what you wanted to do for a profession. And it starts with you being you, you violated the first rule of Aristotle, or whether, know thine self. You didn't want to work hard. The path that the guy painted out before is true for about 80% of law attending. Not all of them, but, but most of them. You didn't want to do math, not because you're bad at it, you were too lazy to do it. And you didn't want to work hard at it. You then chose a liberal arts degree because it interested you intellectually, but it, ultimately it didn't seem hard. <clears throat> you then got your liberal arts degree. <clears throat> you found out it did not pay anything. Up until that point in time, and this goes for every high school and college graduate, you have nothing else in your life. Your education was all you had, and you felt jaded and cheated, and you were. If you're very interested, read my book, Worthless, The Young Person's Indispensable Guide to Choosing the Right Major. You were cheated and lied to, and you wasted all of your youth up until that point. I mean, one to four, you got to play at home, but from five to 22, you were stuck in this educational prison. You're finally free. You were told if you did these things, you would have a job and all would be well. That did not come true. And now you're in the same position that everybody else was in, myself included. Do I go on to get more education? Because that's all you know. I was faced with the same thing. Maybe I should go get my MBA. Thank God I didn't because I didn't have the money. But a lot of you then go on to go into law school. Why? Well, again, you don't want to go back to school for engineering. You don't want to go back to school for accounting. You don't want to go into the trades. <clears throat> and law school is very tempting because, yeah, they'll gladly take liberal arts graduates and liberal arts applicants. But then they also sell you on, again, don't really like to bring politics into it, but they sell you on the political nature and the heroism and the crusaderism and the championing of the plight of the poor people and this and that as a lawyer. And then there's also, oh, lawyers make it. Remember the $118,000? Yes, on average, lawyers make $118,000. Mean average. You need to know median and bimodal distribution. And don't think that your plan was new or unique or crafty. Hundreds of thousands, maybe even millions of people, even my generation, the baby boomer before that, came up with the exact same idea. I'll major in something easy. And then I'll find, I'll be the one who gets lucky and I'll find a nice cushy little job that, that avoids math. Well, I didn't find that. Oh, I'm going to go become a lawyer. Now I'll become a lawyer. I'll make a lot of money. <clears throat> With little to no regard <clears throat> or market research into the legal labor market. And so now you face the same problem you did when you were 22, except now you're 25, 26, 27 when you graduate from law. You have your education. That's all your life has been. And you're educated, and you are, you're very educated. And you're probably very smart if you passed, you got your bar exam, you passed law school. You're, you're certainly not stupid. But now, again, you were lied to. Where are the jobs? And you, again, this is whether you can admit buyer's remorse and that you screwed up. You were lied to, you were misled, you were propagandized by the education environment. And I call it big education, because you guys like big oil, you know, big, big this, big that, big pharma, big tobacco. Oh. <laughs> when you look at how much money you guys, not just you guys, but everybody spends on education, <clears throat> three quarters of a trillion dollars a year from kindergarten to grad school. Um, you were propagandized and channeled into being that. So I will grant you, you were, a, you were a genuine victim in some capacity or regard. But inevitably you have to answer to the real world. 
and realize that you entered a field where there's five times the amount of graduates than there are jobs. And, you know, sure, keep the lines in the water. Hopefully you get a job. I hope you get a job too. But statistically unlikely, and you now need a plan B. Now, if we're going to help people down the road, <clears throat> if we're going to prevent people from making the same mistakes, ruining their financial lives, going into debt, filing for bankruptcy, and being crippled, financially crippled. Because when you get out, if you're 27, you're coming out of grad school, your youth is over. It's over. Now you're middle age. I know your 20s and your 30s still technically kind of consider young, but you're middle age, a third, a third, a third. A third of your life is done and gone. Now what are you going to do? All right. So to prevent future millions of people down the road on into perpetuity of forever, from making this mistake, let's be honest with 17-year-olds. Let's be honest with high school. Let's be honest with people in college, college students, undergrad. And let's be honest with people before you apply for law school. It's large, again, no guarantee. You could be, you could get into tier 14. But for the most part, it's a scam and a racket. Right? It's, it's a money-losing proposition. You're going to cripple yourself financially. You're going to tax yourself psychologically beyond what I can comprehend. <clears throat> and you have to come up with a plan B and completely redo your life from a huge handicap. So this is a warning out of love. This is tough fatherly love of which there's a huge vast dearth of. And why I'm quite successful at asshole consulting. Let's show some tough fatherly love to prevent future kids from making the same mistake. If you're 16 or 17 and you're thinking about going into law school and your name isn't Thaddeus and your last name isn't Rockefeller and your parents aren't rich, and you're not going to be, you got, ain't got the work effort, effort to huck, you know, uh, chucks, uh, to work hard and the hustle and get 4.0s and go into engineering. That's what you ideally would do is you go into engineering or accounting and then you go to law school so you have a good backup plan. You could be an engineer or an accountant. Then you go into law school. But for 80% of you who think, oh, I'm going to major in, I'm going to major in political science. I like it and I won't have to work hard. I won't have to study much. And then I'll become a lawyer. No. No. And I know your teachers and your parents and everyone's telling you, do whatever you want and the money will fall. Fire your heart, the money will fall. No, it won't. It will not. You are going down a path to hell. Guarantee you. All right? So that's, that's the first thing. <clears throat> Second thing related to this, and I quoted the client, the seriousness of rushing into the legal field based on laziness Truth by reputation in the 1960s economics. We've, we've hit on these before. Laziness. Admit it, you didn't want to work hard. That's why you went into the liberal arts. Okay? And admit it, you didn't go back to repurpose your degree into a STEM or accounting or whatever. You went into law school. Because, truth by reputation, lawyers make good money. <clears throat> in the 80s, I even remember the 70s because I was around. Uh, I remember low lawyers, doctors, surgeons. What was that? No, lawyer is a butt end of a joke now title. That's not what, no, lawyer has no more reputation, none. And then 1960s economics, yes, in the olden days, lawyers did do good. In the olden days, if you did go to college, you would come out ahead. Now the market is flooded with not only college graduates, but lawyers as well. And remember our bimodial thing, unless you're in the tier 14 or the tier 1, you're looking at $55,000 median. That, again, plumbers make way more. They do, and they produce more value for society. I just say it. Uh, so please keep in mind, laziness, truth by reputation, and 1960s economics. Also, one of the most regretted professions, physicians and lawyers. Um, and since he wanted me to tell this towards women, I'll, I'll speak to it. I know several women who became lawyers. Um, only one is happy in her life. And she's not a lawyer anymore, right? The others, um, mental issues, not joke. And I, I, I like these people, it's not, I don't, but mental issues, miserable. Two of which are partners in the firms, very successful, very good lawyers. Also, I think one is perpetually insolvent, not bankrupt and insolvent. I mean, she spends just as much as, I don't know, again, this goes back to that. I mean, I don't know how you spend that much money. I just don't. Like, I would have so much to show for it. If I had to spend it, I would be tangible assets. I, we can talk the financial ruin, we can talk the, the, the um, risks, 
But the psychological toll, going to law school and then having such a hyper-competitive environment where there's five times the number of graduates than there are jobs, has just ruined these people. I saw this a lot in banking where people were so competitive and they become bankers, they became robots. They were automatons. All they knew was banking and lending and that's how they valued themselves. Not as a person with a soul or love and care and compassion of friends, family and loved ones. It was their job. And their job doesn't love them back. There's no, there's no scent and being over there at the job. The job is just more work. Um, the three gals I know that are very successful, very successful, they're not having kids. It's too late. Um, they're also, no guy would date them, even if they do make a lot of money. And two of them are very attractive for 40. Uh, but no guy would, because you'd never see them. They have nothing else to talk about but work. I mean, you come hang out with me, I'll tell you about fossil hunting, shooting guns, riding motorcycles, my nieces, uh, how much I like Las Vegas, hiking, um, my fossil hunting collection, uh, rockets, I got into rockets recently, golf, I just picked up golf. I could tell you about a whole bunch. These people can only talk about work and maybe what kind of scotch they like at the downtown bar afterwards. Um, so again, be true to thine self. Don't lie to yourself. Ask yourself what you want out of life first and then logically think about it. And this applies to the men, too. I know you go, I'm going to become a lawyer, I'm going to become a lay asher. I was going to become an investment banker, too, all right? You got to look at it with unbiased eyes, take your bias out, and you have got to. You have got to jettison the propaganda you were fed that you can do anything. No, you can't. That is the biggest lie your parents and teachers and media and television politicians and Oprah ever told. No, you can't. And the sooner you realize that, the sooner you'll make decisions based on the real world, which could still lead to law. Again, you get to Yale. Okay. But the sooner you realize that, the sooner you're going to make decisions based in the real world, and the sooner you're going to have success. Um, oh, this, very important, again, for the ladies. All right, understand, women, especially ladies of color, you are definitely consciously targeted uh, by scam law schools. And are they active scam? No, they're accredited. They give you a degree. Uh, but you're being actively recruited, not because they want to help out the minorities and the women's. They do it because they want your freaking money. Well, they want the taxpayers' money that you're going to borrow and you can't discharge in bankruptcy. And then you're on the hook for at 6.8% interest, right? You want to talk about true racism and sexism. You want to talk about how entities, you want to talk about institutional racism and sexism. This is it. This is a legitimate case of it. Where they look at you and they say, ah, you women need advanced degrees. You gotta go in. You can't. You're nothing. Oh, you don't want to be a stay-at-home mom. You don't want to be. Uh, don't go into engineering. Oh, oh, there's discrimination. And you come to law. And here's how they sell you. They play to your liberal arts degrees and your leftist feelings. Come fight for social justice. Make a change. Make a difference. Get into law. Become an immigration lawyer. This type of lawyer. Activist lawyer. <laughs> You're like, yeah, I'm gonna do that. You don't do any math. How much are they charging? What's the employment prospects look like? Are they under investigation from the American uh, Bar Association? <laughs> the one got busted recently. It was in Florida. Um, there was this hashtag on Twitter. Um, what was it? I have, well, I have it here. Where is it? Did I not save it? Oh, I, I, no, I didn't save it. Um, what was it called? So you can look it up. Women with degrees. That's what it was. Women with degrees. And it's worth it. It's Twitter. It's on Twitter. Go to Twitter. Look. Hashtag women with degrees. And go through every woman. Uh, their, their thing. That's when they were all graduating. Like, I graduated proud and this and that. And I was shocked. It, half. You know, black women only make up 6-7% of the U.S. population. But half of these hashtags were young black ladies graduating from college. And they were almost all of them are all going to go on to get their law degree or master's in social justice or something else like that. And I looked at their undergrads. It was philosophy, women's studies, whatever else. There was no skills. There was no engineering. There was no, none of that. Uh, not, and then the remainder were non-black women, uh, white, and predominantly white. And I went through all of it, uh, not all of it, but most of them, 
trying to find, okay, how many women here like are, okay, engineering undergrad, accounting undergrad, some that if they go to law school and they can't find law job, they have a skill they can fall back upon. Two. There were two girls that had, and I, I think one was accounting, the other was computers or something like that. I can't remember which. Um, ladies, it's not that I want to destroy your dreams, because right now you don't have dreams. What you have are nightmares awaiting for you that have been sold to you as lies as a dream. Right? You're going to go, you're already in debt with a degree that for the most part is pretty worthless and has no economic value. You paid a lot of money for that. Now you're going to go on, you're being asked to double down on your debt for a degree at a school, unless again, tier one, uh, or tier two even, unless it's a really good school, you're going to get an equally worthless and unemployable degree going into arguably the worst labor market ever, five times the amount of jobs, uh, and you're going to go into an insane amount of debt. You may not like the fact I'm destroying your dreams, but I'm not destroying your dreams. I'm destroying your nightmares so you don't have to suffer them. Right? And this gets it back again to tough fatherly love. If you want lies, you can, you can go online, you can watch reruns of Oprah, you can, you can uh, read the newspapers, you can go to salon, you can talk to your professors who have every financial vested interest in telling you that you need more education. You can talk to your parents who love you so much they don't have the, the, the heart to hurt you or your feelings. I'm not those people. I was paid by a guy who wanted me to give and deliver some tough fatherly love and some realistic assessments about becoming a lawyer and going to law school for both men and women skewed towards women, right? And it is the truth, not only to set you free, but can say, it may hurt a little bit, may be a painful pill to swallow, but like all bad tasting medicine, it will cure problems. It will prevent diseases. Right? And that's what we're, I think the client, myself, and a lot of people who are arguing against this education bubble in general, but law school in this particular case, I think that they want to prevent you from making a horrible and sadly an unrecoverable mistake. This isn't like, you, 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 I don't know, you're playing football, you get hit, and you got a cut, now you got some stitches, and it heals up after a bit. This is getting herpes. This is getting a term, not a terminally ill disease, but something that will be with you for the rest of your life. Right? Because if you graduate, I mean, the 17, I was kind of shocked when I did the amortization. Like, wow, 17 years to pay it off. And again, think about that. 17 years, you. Graduate all law school at roughly 26, 27, so that puts you 42, 43. Can't, you got to work in there sometime. That's assuming you're throwing all your money in there. It probably stick with you till you're 50. What does that do to your non-work life, which is what life is about? It's not about careers or education or work. Your life is about the people that you love and cherish that you have around you, family or friends. If you don't want a family, that's fine. But that's what the client, me, and everyone else is trying to do is we're trying to help you from a making a mistake. And the devils and the serpents are going to lie. They're going to whisper every sweet sounding nothing into your ear, telling you how you deserve it and dreams and this and that. Oh, by the way, sign a $120,000 check over to us. I ain't asking you for it. All I'm asking, maybe all I ask you to do, you share this video with people. Maybe buy my book, Worthless. Maybe buy my book, Bachelor Pad Economics, even though it isn't really written for women women can read it a bit do you good um that's all i'm asking you to do is hear me out that's it uh but i ain't i ain't my client ain't and ain't nobody else asking you to fork over one hundred twenty thousand dollars of your money at 6.8 percent interest to get a degree to go into a field where there's five times the amount of graduates than there are jobs i'm not doing that <laughs> uh what else um so please look out getting back to this this is actual discrimination how they are, oh, diversity, we got to get more women and we got to get more people of color into law school. No, they need more bodies to be sacrificed into the volcano. So for my female and my non-white brothers and sisters, please be extremely cautious of them trying to recruit you because of affirmative action reasons. All right. Again, doesn't matter what color or gender, what plumbing you got downstairs. Tier one, tier two, or go home. Tier three and low, below, leave it be. All right. Um, law school, you add up the money and you consider the three years you have to work at law school. If you prorate that at an average wage that Americans make, 
You can pay for a house for cash. 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 Right? No guarantee that's probably going to be a better investment uh, because you'll never have to pay rent ever again. Right? Not to say that you should go buy a house. Uh, I'm just saying, put things in perspective. That's the true opportunity cost of going to law school is free lodging for the rest of your life. Of course, you'll pay property taxes and all that, but that's a different thing. So overall, uh, if you are thinking about going to law school, the general principle would be don't. Just don't. Even if you get into the tier ones or the tier 14, the pressure, the arrogance, the prestige, the Chad Mc Thadwick, the Thaddeus of the thirds and the fourths, who are the Rockefellers and the Rothschilds and the Bushes and, and, and the uh, Clintons. Your life is too short for that. Your life is too short to go to law school. <clears throat> it is probably the worst. Um, only thing I could think of that would be worse is, is getting a doctorate to be a, in the liberal arts to go be an adjunct professor. That's about the worst thing I could think right now. But the, the legal market is hands down <clears throat> the second or third. It's down there. One of the bottom five markets to go into um, uh, as a profession. And given what they're asking you in terms of time and commitment and money, no, it's way too big of a risk. There are so many other things you guys can do, male or female, doesn't matter. And I've highlighted them before. Military, trades, accounting, actuarial science, programming, any, staying at home, just working, just working, um, what, what, on digital marketing, stuff you can go online and get certifications and training for, for, for borderline near free. There is so much other stuff to do that leads to much happier lives. Because I don't, don't know if you knew this or not, you can't take that money with you, right? So the time is here and now. Spend time with family, friends, and loved ones. Spend time having some fun. I mean, you got to work, but you can work smart and not cripple yourself uh, for a worthless degree with a $100,000 price tag that's going to prevent you from having fun and actually living life, all right? So I know the cacophony, the preponderance of propaganda, lies, disinformation that have been given to you about going to law school. That was another thing I noticed is how people were cheering in this women with degrees. They were cheering. I'm like, I got accepted to law school. That's like, I got accepted to get herpes. It does, I got accepted to a prison sentence. I got accepted to bankruptcy. No, please, just don't, don't go, don't go to law school. All right, your life is too precious. It, it, you know, so yeah, the, for some of you, maybe yeah, the top ones you kind of will already know who you are. The rest of you, no, please, do yourself a favor, don't go to law school. All right. All right, anyway, if you know anyone who's going to law school, please send them this video. I'll have links to all my stuff down below. Um, you can look into me later, but uh, if you ever have questions, go to assholeconsulting.com, contact me. Obviously, with my personality, I'm it, it, pot calling the kettle black. I'm not terribly employable myself. Uh, I do all right with this uh, stuff. But if you want to help me out, I have a Patreon account, patreon.com slash Aaron Clary, A-A-R-O-N-C-L-A-R-E-Y. My books are probably the best thing, though, however. Check out my books. Um, you can find those on Amazon.com, predominantly financial and advisory books, some things in education. Foremost would be Curse of the High IQ, Worthless, Bachelor Pad Economics, Reconnaissance Man. That'd be a good one for people to read. Before you go to law school, read that book. That'd be a good idea. So. All right, that's it. Hope you guys uh, benefit from this. We'll talk to you later. Toodles.